Welcome back. You heard my rant a couple of days ago where I went off on... I mean, we're seeing these you know, these attempts at unionization for McDonald's and Burger King and whatnot, the fast food workers in New York, and now it's spreading all across the United States. People saying, seven bucks an hour, we can't live on it. And Walmart workers going out on strike across the country saying, nine dollars an hour, we can't live on that. And how Costco competes in the exact same area as Walmart. They sell pretty much the exact same goods for pretty much the exact same price, but they pay their workers an average wage of $22 an hour, whereas Walmart pays an average of $9 an hour. What's the difference between these two companies? Costco, the two guys who founded Costco, are not billionaires. They are merely multimillionaires. Whereas the six Walton heirs right now, just those six people, have more money than the bottom 40% of America combined. So, you know, this was, this was my rant, that, that, that basically Walmart is, is paying crap wages so that they can continue to funnel money to the billionaires who own them, and if the billionaires got a little less money, Walmart could do what Costco does and pay a decent wage. That's, that's my take on it. Diane Furchgott Roth has a somewhat different take, and I'm curious to hear it. She's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, contributing editor to RealClearMarkets.com. And, Diana, welcome back to the program. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, my position is if a company can't pay or won't pay a living wage, that we should not give them all the rights and privileges that we give to business owners in this country, all the tax breaks and everything else. Um, how, how, can, how do you justify Walmart handing off, you know, literally tens of billions of dollars to its owners and screwing their workers and, and, and say that's a good model compared to Costco where the worker, you know, the owners are multimillionaires, but the workers actually get a decent wage? Well, well, I would say, first of all, the law says you have to pay minimum wage and fast food chains and Walmart uh, follow the law. But I think the more important position is uh, that we're looking at minimum wage workers. They are about fewer than 3% of the total workforce. And people need to get their foot on the first rung of the career ladder. So if someone has skills of around uh, $8 an hour, if they have skills of l- less than $8 an hour, they can't even get in the labor force. If you raise that to $10 or $15 an hour, then you're going to have these teens and entry-level workers who aren't going to be able to get jobs. They're not going to be able to be employed. So I think that's the fundamental problem. Raising the minimum wage won't have that much effect on most people, but it'll stop low-skilled people and teens, the people who are primarily minimum wage workers, getting into the labor force and getting that first job. I well, started if you're, off as a minimum if, wage worker. If your concern is teens and first and entry-level workers, would you support a rise in the minimum wage, so let's say $15 an hour, which is a very low livable wage, for anybody who has been in the job market for more than three or four years? Why stop at 15? I mean, 15 is pretty low. Why not 25 or 30, Tom? Well, probably 15 is, I mean, 25 or 30, perhaps. I mean, the, in, in, if you want to I mean, calibrate I mean, it to U.S. dollars, Denmark's minimum wage right now is $22.80. Yeah, yeah. I mean, why don't we just wait, raise it to $22.50? I think probably $15 is a more reasonable place to start. But why wouldn't you raise it to $22? I mean, if $22 Because at that point, you're actually going to start impacting business. Well, you start impacting at $15. I mean, you start, you're impacting at $7.25. There are people who have skills less than $7.25 who right now are not in the labor market because they can't get jobs. And you impact it every single dollar you go up. What kind of labor is affected. what kind of labor is worth less than seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour? Well, a lot of teenagers. If you look at the African American teen unemployment rate or the regular teen unemployment rate, the teen unemployment rate is right now twenty four percent. The African American teen unemployment rate is forty two percent. Raising the minimum wage doesn't affect many people. It affects teens and low skill workers, and it would make their unemployment rates rise because they would have fewer job opportunities. There is absolutely no historical information that supports that position. Oh, there is. In There's fact, to the contrary. studies by people such as uh, David Newmark of the University of California. Many, many or studies... Please identify any one year. ...that adversely affects low-skill workers. It tell, doesn't affect very many people. Tell me any I one year when we raised the minimum wage and we saw teen unemployment, we saw teen employment or general employment in the workforce go down. There hasn't been one. 
when we raised the minimum wage and saw teen unemployment go down, right? We yes. did not. We saw it go up. No, I, I'm not saying unemployment. I'm saying employment. There has never been a year when we raised the minimum wage and you could see a consequence of that in an increase in unemployment. It's never happened. The people who are affected by this, as I mentioned, are about uh, three or four million people in a labor force of about 150 Six well, let me ve be very clear so then. I'm not just talking about people making $7.25 an hour. I'm talking about people making under $10 an hour. And as you know, that's probably closer to 30, 35 percent of the labor force in the United States. It's, it's lower than 35 percent of the labor force, but there's no point in arguing about numbers. Basically, uh, already employers in the United States are paying higher than minimum wage to 97 percent of their employed workers, not yes. because they're kind but because that's what they have to do to retain their employees. Yes. So, back to Walmart and Costco. Isn't there a point where we say billionaires accumulating tens of billions of dollars, or even hundreds of billions of dollars, I don't know how much the, the, you know, the, the, the six Walmart heirs in aggregate, if they were one person, if Sam Walton was still around, he'd be the richest person on earth. Um, isn't there a point where you say enough already? And, you know, I mean, before the Reagan tax cuts, people didn't accumulate that kind of wealth. Sam Walton didn't accumulate that kind of wealth. But wages aren't set by how much the owners of a company earn, because otherwise you'd have, I don't know, say the owners of a company such as maybe McDonald's or Burger King, maybe they are making a lot, so they should pay their workers more than employees at Joe's Diner, but then that doesn't make sense because then the burgers at McDonald's wouldn't be competitive with the burgers at Joe's Diner. But if what you you're suggesting is right... Productivity. And also you have companies uh, that are not profit-making. You have companies that are operating at a loss that need to pay their employees a lot more because maybe they're high-tech companies such as Amazon.com, which didn't make a profit for very many years, but it still needed to pay people a lot in order to retain them. Well, that's what you get investment money from. But if, the re if, if, your, if your position is correct that wages to workers have not, are completely decoupled from the amount of money that people at the top can suck out of the company, correct. then why is it that the wages, that the amount of money that the people at the top were sucking out of the company in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and up until the mid-80s was fairly constant at about 30 times what an average worker made. And once Ronald Reagan said, if you're at the very top, we're going to take that 74% top tax rate and drop it down to 28%. You can suck all the money out you want. And at that point, we saw an explosion in the income of the top 1%, 270 Five percent now since since Reagan's presidency, we saw a bigger explosion in the top one tenth of one percent, and the one hundredth of one percent is thousands of percent greater, and we saw no increase in wages. Yeah, well, that's because starting your uh, your right, that starting from 1986, the Tax Reform Act of 1986, that made it uh, more profitable for companies to file on the individual tax code. So there are a lot of corporations that before would file as corporations. They switched to filing as individuals because the top tax rate was 28%. So what it seemed as though was that there was a lot more income on the individual earning scale. So that's why data from pre-1986 are not comparable with post So you're saying it's a mirage. The rich actually aren't getting wildly richer and the poor actually aren't getting screwed? I'm saying that comparing pre-1986 data and post-1986 data are not correct. Okay. And in fact, if you're talking about inequality getting greater, these numbers are very, very complicated because uh, the top income earners pay a very high share of tax. The top 1% pay 37% of taxes. The top 5% pay 60% of all taxes. Okay, Diana Furchgott-Roth from the Manhattan Institute. Thank you, Diana. Thanks.